is every service like this, Mark? I mean, I'm, I'm really, I just move here. I mean, I may just come on down. And, uh, <laughs> glory, glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something tells me you guys don't mind if God does what he wants to do. You don't put any restrictions on him. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, it's so good to see so many of you that uh, recognize your faces from nine or 10 years ago. Uh, Carol says 10, so I'm going with her calendar. She's always right. Yeah, to, uh, it's a long time. Lots changed. A lot of things have changed. Uh, as Mark and I were sharing the other day, I know you guys have been through some stuff. Uh, I've heard Bill Johnson say this several times. I, I, I stole it from him because it's really true for us. Uh, 20, uh, 2020 was really a tough year. Uh, and then there was COVID. <laughs> that was really true in our, our lives. Um, but you know, what's remarkable is we we're here, we made it through, you know, I don't know what you guys learned in the process, but I really learned the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. No matter what you go through, no matter what, you think it's going to be an outcome. He's faithful. Yeah. So Mark, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, we've uh, been in Dingley for the last few weeks, few nights. I mean, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, no, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then yesterday we got the opportunity to baptize some folks um, uh, at Seaford Pier. That was pretty cool. I mean, literally cool. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, one of the, a uh, guy that was with us doing worship at the meeting. Uh, well, y'all probably know uh, Elliot Bonzer. Bonzer, yeah, yeah, from Brisbane. He was here for that conference we did at Dingley, and so he came down to the beach and and did worship while we had our baptism yesterday. It was awesome. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, "You know, is it cold?" And I said, "Well, you know, after about the third baptism, I didn't feel anything. I, I, I didn't know if I had legs left or not." There. I assumed they were there because I was standing up. Yeah, it was a little chilly, but it was worth it because, man, they got, uh, if, if any of y'all see us on Facebook, there's a picture of this one particular lady. I thought we were both going going under. I mean, I literally, I, Marilyn, I'm not kidding. I thought we were both about gone because she could, the Holy Spirit hit her when she went under the water and I forgot to ask for a helper. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I was 69 <laughs> and uh, I was doing all I could to, you know, cause I didn't want her to drown. That probably made the papers, you know, but she was out in the spirit. And so finally one of the young men came out and uh, one of the ladies helped and they literally picked her up physically, you know, <laughs> all the way and carried her out of the water and dumped her on the beach. And she was, she was out. She was laughing for a long time. She was the joy of the Lord was really manifesting on her. So it was wonderful. I mean, we baptized five people at Seaford yesterday and they were at the meetings in Dingley and just decided they wanted to do that. And you guys were there, right? Yep. Anybody else in Dingley the other night? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are survivors. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's good to see Paul and Marilyn Sussage. So glad you guys came tonight. I love those guys. They've been close friends for many years now. We first met them at Hillview. Um, in Roeville during that extended revival meeting and God just did so many glorious things there. Uh, and uh, that's, I guess, where we first connected, Mark, you know, through that. Uh, and so many things happened. I cannot explain to you why it's been nine years or 10 years since I've been in Australia. Actually, I've been once, but I didn't make it this far. Uh, ben and Jody Hughes had a meeting up in uh, Queensland called the Pineapple Revival. And uh, so they invited me to come over early on before it was the pineapple revival, it was the Edamonga pub revival when I was there. Yeah, we had a great time though. It was awesome. Yeah, I think God kept moving and they moved up to a different location where that pineapple was, uh, or is, and uh, you know, the rest is history. But that's the only time I've been back in the last 10 years. And that was just for like 10 days. So, but I've really missed, I mean, I've never lost um, my love for this place and the things God spoke to me about what he was going to do in this nation and with this nation, his prophetic destiny over Australia. Um, I've never forgotten it. I, I mean, how can you, when God speaks, you just hold on to that till he does it and it's coming. You know, we're in a new season. 
I think that's the one thing uh, the Lord sent me this time to say to anybody who's listening is that this is a new season. And God's doing a new thing in this new season. Uh, those who have been refined by fire, those who have been, been, been purified by the Holy Spirit, those that have ears to hear, it is a new season. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I, there's a new spirit here. This is fresh. I mean, this is so wonderful, Mark. I just uh, sense such an open heaven over you guys right now. Uh, so would y'all like to hear what I've got to say or you just want to, we could just kind of marinate in the presence, you know, I, I'm fine with that. Psalm 24 is the word the Lord has been giving me for this season. Back in the first of the year, oh yeah, Luke too. I'm glad to re reconnect with Luke. Uh, Luke and I are making plans. We're going, <laughs> and Mark, we're, we got our sights on Myanmar right now. We're we're going. We want the whole country. We, that's interesting. That these there's a connection, a common connection we all have, and so now we've reconnected. And who knows what might happen? Uh, I certainly don't, but God does. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, okay, uh, at the first of the year in January, I heard the Lord clearly say, <clears throat> "Seek my face." The word for this season, this new season you're entering in, this is the word: is seek my face. Uh, he had already spoken to me in 2020, uh, right at the beginning of 2020. He said, uh, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated in the heavenly places. Get your mind off the things on earth. Keep your mind on the things in heaven. So I'd already been in that, you know, that vein, that focus for a couple of three years. Uh, literally, that's what got me through. And we went through some pretty tough stuff. Carol and I both, our family, we lost our daughter, lost about three quarters of our church members in that period of time. I mean, we had some real tough stuff happen. Uh, but in that whole season, I just kept hearing the Lord say the same thing. Seek, uh, keep seeking the things above. Don't look at what's going on around you. Don't look at the COVID, all that stuff. Don't pay any attention to the, get your mind off the news. <laughs> Stop watching the news channels and just focus on what's in the heavenly realm, what he's saying. And literally, you know, that's how I came through all that. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking a lot of others did too. But it was a, a fresh emphasis in January. He said, seek my face. And immediately when I heard him say that, I remembered the psalm that says, when you said, seek my, when the Lord said, seek my face, I said, your face I will seek. And he was looking for a response. And I think right now in this season, in the body of Christ, as the word is coming out, we even sang it tonight, and God manifested as we did exactly what we were singing. And see, that was, that was amazing. That was, I knew it was going to be good because she couldn't even play before we got started. She was out. She was gone. Let's just go back there for a minute. Let's, <laughs> more, more, more. Let's, let's all go there. Uh, uh, anyway, I, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Was so much for that. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Come on, Lord. That's, that's good for me. <laughs> yeah. To, so, uh, seek to seek His face. You know, is is um, the word of the hour. Okay, and as I've shared that with others. Uh, he took me to Psalm 24, and so I want to read Psalm 24, parts of it anyway. We can read all of it. It's really a good place to go. Um, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? As you were singing that a moment ago, who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? You know, as we were saying, Lord, you're holy, 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 only you are holy. He said, no, no, you are too. <laughs> I mean, he is holy in a way that we can't ever be holy. But he said, Jesus actually said, be holy as I am holy. If it weren't possible, then he wouldn't have said to do it. So, but our holiness is not based on our works, not what we've accomplished, not our worthiness. Our holiness is based on the fact that he set us apart. By the blood of the lamb, we've been cleansed from all unrighteousness. And so we're worthy, not because of who we are, or what we've done, because of what he's done in us. All right. <clears throat> who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from God in his salvation. Now, verse 6 is the one, of course, that it stood out to me uh, as the Holy Spirit spoke about this season. It said, this is the Jacob generation of those who seek him, 
who seek his face, seek your face. This is the Jacob generation, those who seek your face. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of descriptions about this generation and what God's doing and, you know, the, the names we give to generations like the Daniel or the Joseph generation. And, and those are all good. But this jumped off the page at me that he's raising up now a Jacob generation. That's the name he gave it. Those that seek his face. And I, I was reading that. I said, why did he pick Jacob? Why is that name used uh, in this context? Because he could have said, you know, Abraham or Isaac. He could have said anybody. But he picked out specifically Jacob. But Jacob was the guy in the Old Testament, the third in line, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He was the guy that would not let go of God would not let go of his inheritance. He was going for his inheritance. He was going for the blessing no matter what. Now, obviously, you know, uh, he might have used some unscrupulous scrupulous ways to get there. But here's the amazing thing about that is God honored it. All right, now you can think whatever you want to think about him or, or about how he did that. But the truth is God honored him by giving him the inheritance and the blessing. <laughs> So you try to figure out God sometime. He can do what he wants to. But I asked the Lord, why, why, you know, why did Jacob get it instead of Esau? They were twins, but by right, by birthright, <clears throat> Jacob uh, should have come out second because he came out second. So why, why did you do that, Lord? And he, and, and he reminded me of the story. And you guys are all familiar with the story, I'm sure. I, I, I think I'm looking at people who read their Bibles, maybe. And just you have, I have that impression. You got to know the story. <clears throat> but, so if you know the story, um, the Bible says that Esau actually despised his inheritance. And the way he manifested that was that when Jacob was cooking the stew, in Texas it would be chili. I'll let it be stew here. When he was cooking, you know, the, the bowl of red, it says in one translation, <clears throat> Esau came in hungry, you know, starving. He'd been out in the fields hunting. He was ready to eat. And he said, you know, give me the bowl. I, I need the food. And, I, I, and he, um, <clears throat> Jacob said, okay, I will, but it's going to cost you your birthright. Uh, now, most of us would have said immediately, uh-uh, no, that's too high a price to pay for a bowl of soup, you know. But Esau said, sure, no problem. You can have it. Now, that's why scripture says he despised his inheritance. It had so little value in his eyes that he would trade it for a bowl of soup. I think that's the reason this psalmist used Jacob as the guy, the name, is because for Esau, he despised the inheritance where Jacob wanted that more than anything else. He had a passion for the inheritance. Hmm. Okay. So if we're going to be the generation that seeks his face, it doesn't mean we're just going to be an ambivalent, passive people. Okay. Whatever comes along, Lord, we'll take it. Hello. Yeah. Or whatever else is more important in our lives. We'll do that first. <laughs> whatever activity we have on our calendar, that's going to take our time. That's more important. No, he's looking for people that are passionately pursuing his presence passionately pursuing his presence. And so he uses Jacob as the example of that. Jacob, in contrast to Esau. All right. And so, as you know the story, it didn't stop uh, with just the birthright. As it went on, as it at Bethel, where Jacob, you know, met God. And then when he wrestled with God, it says he prevailed. He was given the name Israel. And the name Israel literally means he prevailed with God. That's pretty cool. He wasn't going to let go. He wasn't going to give up, right? He may limp when he gets through, but he wasn't going to give up, right? And then he had the experience of the, you know, the stairway, you know, the um, ladder, open heaven over him. So this is a guy who was really pursuing and regularly encountering God's presence. And that's why he's saying in this generation, in this season, I'm raising up a people that have that same characteristic. They're going after my face. Okay. Everybody with me? Oh, good. 
Good. <laughs> Jacob generation. And then, then it goes on, the passage that, you know, we, I love the next few verses. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And I don't think I'm being at all out of order. Every time I read this passage, I say the same thing. His name is Jesus. Amen. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord God mighty in battle. Who is the King of glory? Jesus. Jesus. Who's coming back? Who is that? Uh, one we sang about a while ago with the fire in his eyes and the bronze feet. That's Jesus. Jesus is coming back. But listen, we don't have to wait for him to come back to experience him, <laughs> to seek his face. And so this morning I was really meditating on this. I didn't just, I, I really, you know, this is the word the Lord's given me everywhere I go for Australia right now and for not just Australia and America too. But as I was meditating on this this morning, the Lord just kind of took me to another place to share with you guys tonight. Uh, and it, it's, the same, it's related, but it's not exactly the same word I've been saying, okay? So for some reason, you guys are special. <laughs> but you already knew that, huh? Turn over to Luke, in, in Luke chapter 7. So he, here's the way the Holy Spirit spoke it to me in January. He said, I want you to seek my face, and I want that to be the overriding and undergirding word for everything else you do. In everything you do, whatever visions you have, whatever he's called you to do, whatever your business, your family, the overriding and undergirding word is seek my face, okay? His presence, that's what we're going for. Uh, but I want to read in John, chap I mean, excuse me, Luke chapter 7, where John the Baptist was having difficulty understanding what was going on when Jesus showed up. Now, here's what the Spirit spoke to me this morning. He said, I want you to seek me for who I am, not who you want me to be. Hmm. Let me say that a different way. He wants to be seen for who he is, not who we think he is. He wants to be seen for who he really is. Not our vain imagination of what we think Jesus should be like. Not our fantasy of what Jesus looks like. He wants us to really see him. Does that make sense? See, I think in, all, in, in a lot of our minds, we try to imagine what does Jesus look like. But what the Lord was speaking to me this morning very clearly was, I want the Holy Spirit to show you what I'm really like. I want you to really see my face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't know if that gets you like it did me. It really hit me hard. Not through our own understanding, not through our reasoning, not through our theological grid, not through our experiences of life even. He wants us to literally see his glory. He wants us to see him as he really is. And the only way you can do that is by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to show you Jesus. You can't come up with that in your natural mind. All those paintings you've seen, I guarantee you the one thing, I, I can guarantee this. I mean, I will take money bets, whatever amount you want to bet on it. Not one single one of those paintings is accurate. Now, they're beautiful paintings, you know, lovely, whatever. But I can guarantee you it's not what Jesus looked like then, and it's certainly not what he looks like now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How many of y'all seen The Chosen, the TV show, The Chosen? You know, I love that show. It's cool. It's a cool Jesus. I like, but that's not Jesus. That's an actor portraying Jesus. There's people putting words. And that's good. That's wonderful. It tells great stories. But I'm telling you, there's a reality of Jesus that's beyond our imagination, beyond our reasoning ability beyond our theology of it or any way we could portray it only the holy spirit can show you jesus the way he really is hmm. so that's what we're going after when we seek his face we're asking for the revelation of the knowledge 
of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that. He turns on the light. So what Paul was praying, he said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. What does that mean? Something happens, the light comes on. God shows you what he literally looks like. Huh. Jacob had that encounter. Jacob actually said, I've seen the Lord. Bethel, this is where he lives. I've seen him right here. Huh. That's how confident he was that he'd actually seen God. I'm telling you, he wants to give us a confidence in this hour, in this season, a holy boldness that can only come from having that kind of encounter. We know, we know him because we know him. All right, John the Baptist, interesting. Luke chapter 7. The disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. Uh, what were these things? Well, all the miracles that Jesus was doing and the words that he was saying. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent him to Jesus saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now listen, John is the guy who baptized Jesus. And if you wanted some supernatural confirmation that this really is the Messiah, this really is the one who's to come. I mean, you've got the dove descending, you know, the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. <laughs> and a voice from heaven. That, by the way, we call it Jesus baptism now in our group. Where I, the guys I hang out with, we call it Jesus baptism. Because I like to read that passage. What happened when Jesus got baptized? The Holy Spirit came on him. <laughs> and then there was a prophetic declaration by the Father himself. Here's who he is. And so when I take people in the water now, I say, you better have an expectation that he's going to meet you there. And your old man is going to die, and the new man is being ris risen, and it's going to change things. I mean, anyway, I'm sorry. I kind of went off on that rabbit for a minute. But I, 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 you know, we, we've always said it was symbolic. No, it's way more than symbolic. It's a reality. It's an encounter. And you don't come, go out, you don't come out the same way you go in. Hallelujah. All right. Well, there's that theology. Got that one good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what's exciting about it is so many people are having that encounter in the water. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just had a, oh, I almost said a word you shouldn't say. I had a brain lapse. I had a brain lapse yesterday. I'm 69 years old. I go out in the water by myself in the ocean with the high sea, and I'm trying to baptize people. What was I thinking? You know, but, you know, we need to expect people are going to go out in the spirit. I should have had a helper already because that's what's been happening is that people get whacked in the water and it, you have to fish them out. Yeah. I just forgot. I had a brain lapse. I thought, Finally, there's one, one guy felt sorry for me. His, her son came running out there and grabbed her by the feet and carried her out. <laughs> mm. So John the Baptist was there. He saw that. He heard that. But listen, Jesus didn't look like what John thought the Messiah was going to look like. He didn't come in the way that anybody thought the Messiah would come, although it was clearly portrayed throughout all the prophets, what the Messiah would be doing, like step by step. Have you ever noticed that about the New Testament, about the books, uh, the, the, the Gospels? <laughs> I think it's on me now. I think I'm, <laughs> I may be toast, Mark. Uh, in the Gospels, this was done so it would be fulfilled, what was spoken by the mouth of the prophets. How many is that times is that phrase in the Gospels? Over and over again. They understood that he was precisely fulfilling every prophetic word that was spoken over him, about him. And yet they still couldn't see it because in their minds they had imagined a different scenario. Hmm. That's why it's so important right now to get our faces uh, fixed on him. Because the scenarios that are unfolding in front of us right now, uh, while they are obviously being specifically, they are specifically fulfilling scriptures. Listen, it's, it's unfolding in front of us. But if you've got a preconceived scenario in your mind about what that's going to look like, you may be in for some trouble. 
I'm not going to go into it because I don't even know myself. I'm just saying, I put, I put all the charts and graphs down, and I just said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. You come any way you want to come. I'm not going to tell you you have to come. The fact that I've got it figured out how I think you're going to come, some other guys had that problem too. They were called the Pharisees. They had it figured out how he was coming, and he didn't come that way. I know this. When he comes, there's going to be no mistake about it. The sun, it's going to be like lightning from the east to west. Nobody's going to have to say, is that him or is he over there? Where is... No, Jesus is coming. And when he comes, everything's going to change. Heaven and earth, all of it, boom. Glory to God. Uh, well, where was I? Oh, yeah, John the Baptist. He, he wasn't understanding because he was trying to understand him through a grid of human understanding instead of revelation. And so he said... Um, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And at that very hour, he, he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many he gave blind, he gave the sight. So Jesus answered to him and said, Go and tell John the things that you have seen and that you have heard. Go and tell John the things that you have seen and that you heard, that the blind see... The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended in me. So they come to Jesus and say, <clears throat> are you really him? John wants to know. He says, go back and tell John what you've seen. The dead are raised, the blind get sight, lepers are cleansed, healing miracles, signs and wonders. You tell John what you saw and what you heard and then let him decide. Hmm. We're in a season right now when I think the church is trying to dictate to Jesus what the next revival is supposed to look like. What form we'll accept it in. What it needs to look like. Who it needs to come through all the parameters of our acceptability and what is it going to have to do to be culturally relevant for Australia or America or wherever you are? What are we going to have to do to get to this generation? I'm telling you the way God gets to people is the same way he always got to people. He reveals Jesus. Jesus shows up, and when Jesus shows up, he does what Jesus does. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed, for God was with him. All who were oppressed of the devil, I let that out. <clears throat> are we willing to be satisfied, not just satisfied, are we willing to celebrate the fact that Jesus shows up? Whether anybody else does or not. Whether the crowned heads of Europe get on board or not whether all the entertainers are on board or not, whether all the preachers on TV are on board or not, are we going to get excited just when Jesus shows up? We should. He's enough. That's all we need. Uh, one of the characteristics of my journey through the years in ministry has been I don't usually get sent to the great big places. I've been to some big places. It was fun. But I, tell you, I felt just more at home tonight <laughs> in this place than just about anywhere I've been in a long time. But in that journey of being in a lot of small places, I picked up some characteristics that people who are in small churches or small towns, small ministries, I picked up some, some uh, characteristics that I think we're working against sometimes. And this is the mindset that I, I think gets us in trouble. If, if this was important, then God wouldn't be doing it here. If this was important, if this really was God, it would be happening to people somewhere that are important. Huh? In other words, I can't really fully embrace the fact that the glory of God manifested in this room tonight in worship <laughs> because it wasn't in Sydney. It wasn't at Hillsong. It wasn't on the stage somewhere with the right guys. And it probably won't ever get on TV. 
you understand? <laughs> Nobody was, was anybody recording, putting it on YouTube? We may be on TV. I don't know. In other words, I think that got y'all. I think y'all know what I'm talking about. Is it, can we get just as excited and I, not just to be emotionally excited, but can we become just as engaged in his presence, in his glory, as if there were thousands here because the innumerable saints of the firstborn, right? They're around us. We're, we've got, the crowd is here. The angels are here. The Holy Spirit is here. Yeah. And so what makes the meeting significant tonight is not that I'm here, obviously. You picked me on a bad night. I mean, I'm still recovering from the <laughs> baptism yesterday. Uh, <laughs> but listen, What's significant is that he shows up. And that's what makes you significant. That's what makes me significant. And really, that's all the significance we need. We've got his endorsement. We've got his power that gives us boldness and confidence to speak as we ought to speak. Because why? We're saying what he's saying. We're hearing his voice. We're seeing things through his eyes. And this is the most incredible thing. I still can't get over this. I grew up a Baptist. You just have to forgive me. And I still can't forget. I still can't get over this. Thank you very much. I can't get over the fact that God gives us the authority and power that Jesus had. Now, I'm not saying I don't believe it. I'm saying I just can't get over the wonder of that, that, hey, he will heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, give you oracles to speak his very word. He gives that to people like us. Hmm, that's pretty amazing. But that's, ex that's his plan. That's the way he set it up. But there is one requirement, and I'm getting back to the point. We seek his face. He doesn't, give it, he doesn't just give it to everyone. All right. And when the messengers of John departed, he began to speak to the multitudes. <laughs> and he talks to them about John the Baptist. It's really interesting. I don't know if I need to read all this or not, but how many of you ever, have ever read this before? Okay, he starts talking to him about John the Baptist. He said, uh, listen, what did you guys go out there to see? I said this the other night in the meeting in Dingley, but it hit me so hard. What did you expect it to look like? The move of God. What did you expect it to look? We had a, we had a, a lady that was manifesting uh, joy that night, you know, in the ministry time. Like she was just laughing hysterically, which I love it. I love it. I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just came over me just to say this out loud. And I wasn't trying to get on to anybody. I just, just came on me like, what did you expect it to look like? She was the only one laughing. So what did you expect it to look like? See, if God shows up and puts everybody on their face on the floor, what did you expect it to look like? If he raises somebody from the dead in front of you, what did you expect it to look like? If the fire and the glory come, and he does unusual signs and wonders. Isn't that kind of what you thought might happen? Maybe not. <laughs> See, I, th I think we've confused the glory of God with a warm feeling in worship. Now, I'm all for warm feelings in worship. Don't misunderstand me. But the glory of God is more than just a feeling. The glory of God is his manifested presence. Hmm. And when he manifests his presence, all kinds of things happen. All kinds of things happen internally. People get transformed. That's the reason he does it. We're transformed, right, by the presence of God. By the, when we see his glory, you know, I'm quoting 2 Corinthians, you know it, but when we see his glory, we're transformed into the image we behold. Hmm. So changes happen internally. But it doesn't stop internally because that's not where God stops. <laughs> he takes over. He takes over a room. He takes over a life. He doesn't just limit himself to a Sunday morning service or a series of special meetings. He, he comes in and he takes over. Hmm. That's what it means to be king of kings and lord of lords, by the way. He takes over. He rules. He reigns. And so he comes in dominion. He comes in power. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Dominion. He manifests his authority, and he releases his dunamis power. Um, 
the Lord's been correcting me for years about this, and you didn't say it tonight, so you won't take this personally. <laughs> I used to preach a lot. Lord, I'm just seek your face. I don't want to. I'm not. After, I don't want to see your hands. I don't want your hands, Lord. I just want your face. And that sounds. I mean, I think it's a good thing to say. I've said it a lot myself. Until one day, the Holy Spirit corrected me and said, "What is it about my hands you don't like?" <laughs> it was a good question. And I realized I'd kind of got you know super holy, you know, like beyond God holy. I like, yeah, like, oh yes, Lord, I just want. I hope I didn't offend anybody with that because I don't mean to because we've all been in that place where we really do. All we want to see is him. All we need is him, just his touch, just to hear his voice. But we need to understand that with his touch and with his voice comes a whole range of other things that he wants to do in the world, in the physical realm. Hmm. So he wants to touch Frankston. He wants to feed the poor like you guys are doing. That's what it said in there. I mean, <laughs> the scripture says that. Isn't that amazing? Y'all are doing something the scripture says. You know, He wants to take care of the brokenhearted. He wants to heal the brokenhearted. He wants to come into people's lives and put those lives back together. He wants to redeem that which is lost. He wants to restore and renew. Hmm. And yes, he wants to heal sick people. And he wants to cast out demons. <laughs> Jesus was really good at it. There's not one single case where it didn't work. There's actually not one single case where it took more than one command. Like, out. Okay, we're gone. Uh, oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. If y'all were, if you ever just ever, I don't know, maybe not. If you grew up Pentecostal, you probably never asked this question, but Lord, why did you pick tongues? Y'all ever ask that question, like, what is it about that? Why did you pick tongues? Have you ever thought of it? Most of you probably been doing it so long, you had not even ever thought about it anymore. But it's like, you know, that's offensive. I mean, that's what gets you kicked out of some places. That's what, that's what, that's the line in the sand. You know, like, you do that, you're out, you know? Why did he pick that one, you know? <laughs> well, you know, Paul gives us a clue. He says, the least of the gifts. It's, it's the one thing. That like makes no sense, right? It doesn't make any logical sense. I mean, you guys all know why. I know. You know the scriptures. You pray in tongues because you're uttering in the spirit and your spirit's praying in the spirit and you're communicating with God. I know all that. What I'm saying is, though, to a human understanding, it doesn't make sense. It's when, when God takes over your mouth, you know? Hmm. <laughs> huh. 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 He does some things just for the specific purpose of offending our natural minds. He does the things he does the way he does them for the specific purpose of offending our natural minds. That's why he said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Because most of what he does, the way he does it, is offensive to the natural mind. It's contrary to the spirit of the world. It doesn't make sense. Hmm. So if you're going to come into the kingdom reality, if you're going to flow and function and operate in the same authority, the dominion, the power the king operates in, then you're going to a different level of thinking, a different level of understanding, and that only comes by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Not the reasoning of men. All right. Okay. That's what I got this morning. <laughs> I like the part down the little further where it says, uh, to what shall we then liken this generation and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you wouldn't dance. And we mourned for you and you did not weep. Hmm. There's a one word description of that. Fickle. Y'all have the word fickle in Australia? <laughs> fickle. It's like, okay, you want, you want joy? Okay, I'll give you joy. Hmm. Didn't like that. You want mourning? Okay, we'll give you mourning. Didn't like that. Didn't like John the Baptist. 
And, and listen, in the church, if we're going to seek his face, we've got to get beyond what we want, what we expect, how we think it should happen, and get into that realm where we give him permission to do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. Thank you, Lord. So the four things that the Lord told me he was going to do this year, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to seek my face. He said, there's four things I'm going to do. Would you like to know what they are? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure Carol's still awake over there. That's a, it's a really comfortable couch. <laughs> she is awake. I'm, I'm proud of her. I really am. <laughs> she may be more awake than I am right now. Um, oh, y'all are doing that. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. Four things he said to me. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to seek my face. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm um, gathering my harvest. This is a season. This season we're entering in now that's begun already is a time of gathering. Don't say the harvest is 10 years from now or five years. Are we going to do this plan? Are we going to get this system worked out? Are we going to get all our ducks in a row and then the harvest is going to come? No, the harvest is right now. And, you know, I, I've come to realize more recently that not everybody grew up in a farming community like I did. Not everybody understands the dynamics of wheat farming. I don't know how many of you do, but the reason he used the phrase white unto harvest has a specific meaning. If, if you've ever grown wheat or any other grain crop, you know that when it's time to harvest it, it changes colors. It gets white. It gets really a bright color. And that means the moisture content has reached that point where it's easily going to come off uh, the combines can come in and take it out. It also means that if you don't get it right then, it's going to fall off and you're going to lose it. And so it's like a precise moment. Just when it's just right, you go for it. Well, what Jesus is saying is that right now is the time. When's the harvest supposed to come in? Right now. Hmm. Hallelujah. So pray for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. I love that. I love that. <laughs> God obviously has a Jewish sense of humor because uh, he told them to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. And he immediately, the next verse, okay, now you guys go. The guys that he had pray for that, they were the answer to their own prayer. <laughs> Look it up. It's in the Bible. And he sent them out. And what happened? He, they did everything he did. Heal the sick, cast out demons. Came back rejoicing. See, God's calling us in a now harvest. It's right now. But I believe there's a special season of harvest on the earth today. The prophets have talked about a billion soul harvest. Listen, that's beyond us. That's why the Lord said he's going to do it. Yeah. You know, I've been seeing things happening around our little town where I live that defy explanation. People that are adamantly, have for years been adamantly against the power of God have been, you know, in church, but no miracles, no signs and wonders, what they call cessationist. Suddenly in our little town, they're getting hungry, having meetings, seeking the Holy Spirit. The pastor of the largest church in town of that type, the most cessationist church in our town, the pastor's gotten filled with the Spirit. And listen, he preached in our church. For two Sundays now, he's preached twice in our church. He was preaching about, he, this is the revelation. It's so funny talking to him. Is oh, This is online. Uh, the, the, uh, but he wouldn't mind me sharing. It's, it's really cool for me to get to talk to him. Because he called me one day and says, hey, I, I hear you all talk about rhema words from God. What does that mean? And I said, well, that's when the Spirit gives you a word that really comes alive in you. And it's for right now. It's a, it's a rhema word, Greek rhema. Uh, logos is a general word usually. Rhema is a specific word. He said, oh, okay, I think I got a rhema. <laughs> and he starts telling me what, he's, what he heard when he was reading his Bible. And I said, yeah, I think you did. And so I asked him to come preach it at my church. And this is what he preached. He talked about the restoration of the tabernacle of David when he brought the, the ark back into the city and, and established it in the tent. This is the guy, this is a cessationist preaching this. And he said, what the Lord showed him was that 
David put the ark at the center of the tabernacle. He didn't put it in the Holy of Holies or at the edge. He put it right in the middle. And he said, here's what the Lord told me. He said, Jesus has got to be the middle. He's got to be the center. I said, I hadn't gotten that one. <laughs> wow, that's cool. I've never seen that. But that's exactly right. Is it Jesus is the center? And okay, so then when he's preaching in our church, Sunday morning, <laughs> their church lets out really early. So our worship is still going when they're done. So he gets there in time to preach in our church. <laughs> but uh, so he's, he's going to read out a revelation, the passage we were kind of talking about tonight in worship, where the 24 elders are gathered around the throne. He's in the center. Yeah. But he starts to read that uh, scripture. He said, has everybody turned there? And as he starts to try to read it, he does this. He goes, oh, he bends over. The Holy Spirit hits him. He doubles over. He can't speak. I mean, he was whacked by the Holy Ghost. I mean, it went on for about three or four minutes. He couldn't even stand up. <laughs> And when he, got, when, he, when he was able to talk again, he said, well, that's never happened before. <laughs> huh. But I want you guys to, maybe I need to tell you all the whole story. I don't know how much time we got. I'm getting hungry, but uh, let me tell you how wild this really is. Okay, when I say God's going to do this stuff, I mean he's really going to do it. And maybe I'm in a little bitty place just to encourage other people that are in little bitty places that he can do great big things in little bitty places. Okay. So I'm in this little town of 10,000 people in West Texas, which has no significance for anybody except the people who live there. <laughs> and, you know, it's not on anybody's radar. We're not, you know, anyway. Uh, a friend of ours, a, a guy that's a, an evangelist, a prophetic guy, um, called one day. One, my elder, we, there's two elders in our church, me and this other guy. <laughs> it's a great big church. And uh, we're in the office praying, Lord, what do we do next? I mean, we've been through 2020. We've been through all that stuff. We knew God wanted to restore and renew some things, but it just wasn't happening. You know, it was like, do we shut down? Do we sell the building? What do you want us to do, Lord? I mean, that's where we really were, honestly. We weren't, we weren't in despair. It was just like we didn't know what to do. And we prayed that prayer out loud, the two of us. The phone rings, and it's a friend of mine. And he said, the Lord just spoke to me and told me to call you and tell you, you need to have a tent revival. Okay, now listen, I'm not, you know, a great man of faith. I'm going, all right, sure. But I mean, as soon as we, as soon as we prayed, he, the phone rang, I picked it up. He said, you need to do a tent revival. We, we don't have money to pay the electric bill. All right, I've gone without a salary for two months now. You, tent revival, you know, we got 10 people in this church left. You know, they're, we're looking at each other, where are we gonna go? There's no place else to go. Uh, I said, okay, Lord, if this is you, you're gonna confirm it. Well, the other elder, <laughs> He was a great guy named Eddie Carl. He, uh, he looked at me and said, I think that's the Lord. And I said, well, I know it's the Lord. I just don't believe it yet. You know, <laughs> I know that was the answer to the prayer we just prayed. No doubt about it. But I'm still kind of having to work into this, all right? And so he goes out of the office that day. I don't see him for a few hours. He comes back. He said, hey, I was down in a, a business a while ago, and I ran into this guy that's a friend of ours um, who's an elder at the Church of Christ. <laughs> Oh, I said the name. Uh, they're different over there than they are here. Church of Christ here is different in a good way. Uh, they're not cessationists, most of them, and they do believe. Well, anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, I won't go off on that, but he met an elder from this church and uh, in the business, and he said, I was telling him about we want to have a tent revival. Eddie Carl's done, he's jumped way ahead of me. We're going to have a tent revival. I'm not even there yet. It's like, I'm still going to weigh this word, test the spirit, you know, <laughs> being very pastorly about it. And he's, no, he tells this guy, we're going to do a tent revival. And the guy says, hey, that sounds cool. He says, uh, well, we're looking for a place to have it. We don't really know where to have it. I didn't know we were looking for a place to have it, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's, we're looking for a place to have it, we, you know. And the guy says, well, maybe you can have it on the vacant lot next to our church. Let's go talk to the elders about it and see. So Eddie Carl comes back and tells me about this meeting. And this is where I really go into deep unbelief. All right. We're going to go to the elders of this church and ask to use their vacant lot next to their church for our charismatic Pentecostal tent revival. Right. And I said, okay, I didn't say it out loud, but in my mind, I thought, 
That'll be the end of that deal right there. That's, that's not going any further than that. So he goes, meets with the elders. He had this one little tidbit of history that he had been really honed in on for years. He had been studying the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky at the turn of the century, uh, the 18, uh, from 1700s to 1800s. Big revival in the United States. Uh, they call it the Second Great Awakening. 30,000 people show up in an open field just to have a move of God. You know, it's just an amazing move. Well, he was a student of that history. That's where that denomination started. They don't even know it, most of them. You have to tell them their own history because it's been squelched for so long. But that's where they started. And so he tells this group of elders their own history. And they say, oh, well, we used to hear people talk about that. I think he's telling the truth, you know. But... <laughs> I'll just get to the point. At the end of that meeting, they said, sure, use our lot. That'll be great. And the guy that was the first elder that he talked to uh, said, I think I'm supposed to pay for that tent. And he said, I'll do it better than that. He said, I'm going to pay for the generators, the tent. We got these big air conditioner things, outdoor air conditioner. I'm going to pay for that and the porta potties. I'm going to pay for the whole thing. We're having the re tent revival, our meeting on their lot. And they're paying for it. <laughs> how many of you got, does anybody under, no, you couldn't understand how impossible, that's like Jesus walking on the water stuff in America. Even if we were closely related to another group, they wouldn't do that for us. <laughs> and these are the, uh, these are the other guys. Those are, we're that church, you know, don't go to that church. You know? Anyway, <laughs> so we have the meeting. And I invite my friend, you know, they gave me the word on the phone. So maybe I should invite him. One of the things I didn't tell you in that same conversation, he said, you need to call your friends in Houston, two churches that I relate to in Houston, all young guys, like really young, early 20s. <laughs> the pastor is 28. He's the oldest in the church. I said, uh, invite them to come help you. So I did. I mean, by this time, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? We're going to have the tent. I'm going to invite him to come. And we did. And we have this amazing meeting, a series of meetings. They weren't big as tar in terms of lots of people, but the glory of God just kept manifesting. And man, there was one guy that was on his way to commit suicide that night. And uh, one of our team members met him at the restaurant in the parking lot and got to witnessing to him. He got saved, came and got baptized that night. Got you know, it's just, you know, cool stuff happening. Well, one of the nights of the meeting, that pastor comes to the meeting. He felt like he should, kind of out of obligation. Uh, kind of, he, he was a pretty open guy. He wasn't really, you know, as bad as it sounds, but he, he just wanted to be, uh, you know, friendly and check things out. So he and a couple of other people came from the church. Well, that night, um, one of our young kids, one of our 12-year-old girls had a word of prophecy. I mean, it was right on. <clears throat> She got up, she got the mic, she prophesied. And I don't even remember what she said now, but it was God, you know. And so the next day or so, the pastor calls me. He says, I've never seen anything like that before. He said, but I know that was God. That little girl couldn't have done that. What she said, she, she couldn't even know. He said, that had to have been God. Opened him up. And it, since then, in the last three, four, five months, six months, I guess. Are you, oh, <laughs> Yeah, it has. It's been a year. Uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. So in the last year, this man has taken the journey from being, you know, completely on the other side of that fence to fully embracing. And it started in that temple. Now, why did I go to trouble to tell you all that story? If you think you don't have enough, that's okay. He does. He does. If you don't think you have what it takes to reach your city, to reach your nation, Apparently, you don't have to. I was taught you had to have it. You got to get this together. You got to plan it. You got to get all the guys on board. You got to do all. When God moves in on the scene, He just does it. And listen, if that was the only thing that was happening, that would be enough. But since then, we've just seen all over town things like that happening. So I guess I'm just trying to encourage you guys. It's, it's time for harvest. It's a harvest season, but it's not up to you. The Holy Spirit's going to do it. He said, I'm going to do it. Now, he's going to use you, but it's his power, his anointing. You just stand back and watch him do it.
He's going to give you boldness. Second thing he told me was, I'm going to gather my people. The enemy's been trying to do everything he possibly can to keep the body of Christ from meeting together. And that's because he doesn't want to see Jesus' promise and prayer fulfilled that they will know that they will know that they're my disciples, that we have love one for another. And it's time for the church just to get out of that mentality. Meetings are important. Coming together as the body of Christ is important. Now, what we're assembling around, though, is Jesus. Not one gift, not one theology, not one denominational identity. We're assembling around Jesus. Hello? It is different. It's not the past. It's not what we've done in the past. Um, how many of y'all are aware of what was called the Asbury Revival that broke out in the U.S.? Okay. I watched that in amazement, you know, just night after night, just weeping. I didn't go there uh, because really they didn't want you to come because <laughs> it was packed out and there was students and they didn't want to pollute it with a lot of preachers. <laughs> I'm sorry. but <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean that, Mark. <laughs> you know, I, I understood. They didn't want a lot of big name ministries coming in there trying to co-opt it. And so they're actually encouraging folks not to come because they had so many people they didn't know what to do with them anyway. But as I was watching that night after night, weeping, you know, on YouTube and different places where people were <laughs> doing what they weren't supposed to be doing, taping it, um, the Lord began to speak to me and he said, this is a model. I'm doing something new. This is a model. This is what this move is going to look like. It's going to be spontaneous. And it's going to come organically from the people and it's going to be led by worship. In his, yeah, he, in, he inhabits the praises of his people. He said it's going to be worship. It's going to be focused on Jesus, not the personalities. Now, you need to know this about that move. There were leaders, but they were behind the scenes. They were helping the students, giving them advice, counseling them. But it was the students, and you didn't even know who, what students were going to be doing it. You know, And the Lord just began to say to me, this is going to be the model. Just get ready. Get ready for worship just to break out. Get ready for my people just to go after me. The, the church wants its song back. The people of God want their song back. He's going to go into this place with us of, of like we did tonight. I mean, I, I don't have to tell you all about this. We did it tonight where we just get caught up in his presence in worship. And he takes us to that place, you know, that realm where he dwells. <clears throat> but this is what I thought at the same time as he was saying this to me. I thought, you know who's going to have the hardest time with this? It's not going to be the evangelicals or the cessationists. It's not going to be, you know, the people who are going to have the hardest time with this is us, the revivalists. Because there's no guy up at the front. We can't capitalize on this. We can't make any money off this deal. We can't increase our mailing list off of this deal. This is just God's going to do it. <laughs> and I actually got happy about it. Because, you know, I was saved during the Jesus revolution. And I never knew who led that thing until the movie came out last year. It's like, oh, that's who, that's why that happened. Oh, okay. Because we were, we weren't in California. We were in, you know, Texas, but the same move hit us when I was a teenager in high school. It was just Jesus. It was a Jesus movement. It was Jesus people. That's what it was about. And that's where he's taking us as the church. Now that doesn't mean you won't have leaders you got to have leaders. He always works through men and women to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's going to be an ongoing thing. But what's going to be out front and what's going to be touching people by the thousands, by the millions, is just his presence. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he told me it's a time of harvest. It's a time of assembling. When he blows the horn, assemble. And it doesn't matter if it's somebody you thought you wouldn't assemble with before. One of the interesting conversations I had with some of our people was they thought that church over there was a cult. I had to convince him it's okay for that guy to come preach. <laughs> you may end up in some places that some of your friends might wonder why you're there. You may be rubbing shoulders with some folks that in the past you wouldn't rub shoulders with, but the Holy Spirit's knitting hearts together in love. He's assembling his people. Third thing he said I'm going to do is build. I'm going to build my house. It's his house he's building. All right? <laughs> And he's building his house, and this is where I get to kick in, all right? <laughs> because I, I've been here for a few years. <laughs> he's building his house to fill his house with his glory. 
He's building a container, a vessel, a people that are just pure in their desire, not perfect, but pure in their desire, that just want Jesus. And to be filled with his glory and let his glory have a habitation in us. That's the church he's building. Mm. Hallelujah. The fourth thing he said was this, I'm going to restore. The time of the restoration of all things. I'm going to restore what the enemy has stolen. I'm going to restore. I'm going to restore what people, the dreams that you had, the, the hopes that you had, the prophetic words that you gave up on, I'm going to restore. And you're going to see things happen quickly that you thought would never happen again. And it's really important. This is another thing I heard at the first of the year. <sighs> There's a door open before you. A lot, of, a lot of guys came out with this word on the Jewish New Year, that the doors are open in front of you. Well, yeah, that's true because it always is. I mean, you know, he's placed a door in front of you that's always open. But in another sense, that God's about to open doors of ministry, doors of revelation, doors of things, of promises being fulfilled. He's going to place you in places of effective ministry. The doors are going to be opening. And Chris Vallotton said this, I think it's one of the most astute things I've heard in a long time. He said, the body of Christ needs to stop knocking on doors that God has locked. Look for the open doors. Look for the doors that are open. Just quit knocking on the doors that are closed and gone and dead and done. Knock on the door. One other thing that I want to say, uh, because the Lord spoke it to me really clearly when I got here the other day in Melbourne. How many of y'all have heard the phrase, redigging old wells? Yeah. Redigging the ancient wells. Okay, I, it's a good phrase. Prophetic word. I think it's uh, been very accurate in a lot of ways. But here's what the Spirit said to me. When you're redigging old wells, remember what you're after is fresh water. <laughs> when you're digging old wells, redigging old wells, remember what you're after is fresh water water. We can't recreate what happened in 1971. We can't recre recreate what happened at the Cane Ridge Revival or at the uh, Dingley Revival or the Monash Revival. We can't re recreate those things. He doesn't even want us to, but we can dig in the same place they dug, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, the move. Hallelujah. Fresh water. It's not Coincidental, matter of fact, it's intentional by God that in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we just passed, you know, like two weeks ago was the Feast of Tabernacles. In the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' day, he stood in the midst of the tabernacle and said, there's going to be living water, right? Because they have a ceremony about water in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles. And he stood that day intentionally to say, just like he did to the woman at the well, it's not going to be a well like Jacob's well. It's not going to be a well like that well in Samaria. This is going to be a well that's springing up out of you. Living water, hello, <laughs> the Holy Spirit coming straight from the throne room, the river of God springing up inside of you into eternal life, never ending life. So the well that we're digging, yes, it's an old well, but it's the life of the Holy Spirit that's fresh and right now and new every day. Times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Uh, how many of y'all need refreshing? How many of y'all need restoration? I still need some restoration. God's restored so many things in the last year, but I still need some. This trip is a trip of restoration for me. I'd given up on Australia. God didn't, but <laughs> no. And I don't mean I gave up on you guys. I gave up on me coming back to Australia. It's like, that's over, that's done. That door's closed. It was fun. Really enjoyed it but I don't think I'll ever be back. And then here I am, here I am, you know, like, okay, Lord, I didn't do this either. The first church that I ever came to in Australia invited me for a conference um, three weeks ago in Brisbane. And so we went, that's, that's the reason we came. And then uh, Stephen Allison set up this meeting here, which was the second, you know, I mean, it's kind of like I'm following the same trail that we, as last time, but, I just sense this time that you guys are in your season of fulfillment, your prophetic fulfillment. 
one of the things I've always said about revival is that revival is God's tool for propelling his people into their prophetic destiny. The, the fresh move of the Spirit, a fresh outpouring of the Spirit that then doesn't just end with that meeting or that particular move. It then propels his church, his people, into their prophetic destiny. So it's actually the foundation you build on that God wants to accomplish in your nation. And so I think that's where you are now. I think God's bringing a fresh move of his spirit that's going to be by his spirit, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. <laughs> and it may bypass some of the places that you thought it was going to come through, but he's going to get it done because he's decreed it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Restore. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Renew a right spirit within me, and then will I teach sinners your ways. <laughs> He's going to start with the church. He's starting with us. Seek my face. Lord, your face will I seek. Your face will I seek. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And all the things that I just said, the four things that I just said, he said he was going to do. The thing he said we're supposed to do is seek his face. We want to see all that happen. Seek his face. If you've got some issues in your life right now that may seem bigger than anything else that's going on, you need to seek his face. If you want to overcome that mountain, if you want to move to the next level, if you want to see the breakthrough that you feel he has for you, then you just need to seek his face. Yeah, did I? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Jesus, thank you, Lord. I was really encouraged. The moment I walked in the room, I could feel the presence of God tonight. And I got even more encouraged when the keyboard player couldn't play the keyboard. Or actually, she couldn't quit playing it. She, her hands were just... <laughs> I saw Sue, take your hands off the keys. <laughs> when he moves in and takes over, what do you do? You just yield. You let him do it. You let him come. That's what you asked for. What did you think it would look like? <laughs> On the day of Solomon's temple being dedicated, they were all flat on their face when the glory came in. What do you expect it to look like? God takes over in his house. Why don't you guys stand up? Let's pray. Uh, Mark, Sue, can I just encourage you guys that, yeah, I want to encourage you guys that I feel really a kinship that you guys have been through the fire, and you know that, I don't have to tell you that, but I just see him establishing you in greater and higher and more than you ever would have done before. You know, maybe it was necessary. I don't know. Maybe it was pruning back. But whatever it was for, he's taking you to the next level now. Yeah. Yeah. And those of you that have joined yourselves with this ministry, and some of you for years, you've heard prophetic words for years. You've heard God say things about, and you've had dreams and visions. And I, I think what my message to you tonight is, is just stand back and watch it happen. Seek his face and just stand back. Relax. Release it. Stand back. And what you can trust the Holy Spirit. You can trust him. Luke, you can trust him. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. <laughs> come, Lord Jesus. Come. Just lift up your hands now. Say, so, Lord, your face I will seek. Jesus. Thank you, Lord.